Are DNA kits useful in providing actionable info and any thoughts and information on using genetic testing to guide nutrition and exercise? I assume they're talking about like 23andMe, that type of um, SNP testing. Yeah. I mean, I think we need to put this in a broader context, right? Which is um, exactly 20 years ago, we were on the cusp of, uh, and by we, I don't mean me. I <laughs> specifically exclude myself from being a part of that. You we, and Watson and uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ventner. Yeah, exactly. We were on the cusp of, uh, you know, sort of what was hailed as perhaps the biggest revolution in all of medicine, right? It was, uh, it's one thing to certainly understand the structure of what DNA meant and how to how to understand the coding language and how DNA becomes a template to make RNA is the template to make protein. Um, but 20 years ago, sitting there on the cusp of actually decoding the human genome, and we now know that there are, you know, it depends. I mean, I, I used to typically nominally say 20,000 mm -hmm. uh, genes in the human genome. I, th I think some would actually revise that upward and say maybe even closer to 30 now. But, you know, a relatively finite number of genes. And um, it turns out that hasn't panned out, right? This notion that knowing the genome was going to change everything, um, it hasn't panned out. And it hasn't panned out for several reasons, right? So um, first of all, most things that we concern ourselves with are either wildly polygenic or the only way you get the thing, either good or bad, is when the environment, for lack of a better word, turns on the gene. Um, and so if we talk for a moment about the pathology side of things and use cancer as an example, right? This seemed to be the most interesting place where we would think that the genetic revolution would help and that by knowing your genes, you might know your susceptibility to a type of cancer. So I think the first thing we want to talk about here is the difference between somatic mutations and germline mutations. So the germline is the gene that you inherit. So when you do a test like a 23andMe, um, and we, I, I think for the purpose of not getting too far in the weeds on this, and maybe we could do it. This is actually worth a dedicated podcast, so maybe we can make note of that and just do a dedicated podcast on genetic testing because it is such an important topic. Um, I'm not going to get into the difference between what a 23andMe is doing versus what a whole genome sequence is doing as far as uh, the accuracy of it. So notwithstanding the huge inaccuracies that show up when you do these short kit SNP tests, what you're doing is looking at the template you inherited, hence germline. Now, there are some cancers that are driven by germline mutations. In other words, there are a subset of cancers where just knowing you inherited a certain gene dramatically increases your risk of that cancer. So the BRCA mutation would be an example of that. Uh, Lynch uh, syndrome, which is an acquired genetic syndrome, would be an example of that, where all of a sudden you have one of these mutations and the probability that you're going to get cancer is is very high. In the case of Lynch syndrome, it's virtually guaranteed you're going to get cancer. In the case of BRCA, it's not quite as high, but depending on which variant of it, it can be still quite high, probably approaches 80% um, with at least one variant. And so that would knowing that information be helpful? Oh my God, of course it would be helpful. As a general rule, unless you are adopted, you generally know that without a genetic test. That's, that's how... Um, penetrant these things tend to be. Now, so, so, so in other words, it's very unlikely that you show up and you're in your 30s or your 20s um, and you know your ancestry, so you know who your parents are and you know who your grandparents are and aunts and uncles, and you're gonna, have, you're gonna get a surprise on a genetic test by showing up with one of those syndromes. So the first thing I put in the back of my mind is patients who are adopted uh, probably benefit from this. And I have a friend who was adopted and who got Lynch syndrome. And that was a real surprise to all of us because why was a guy in his early 40s getting colon cancer? And especially the way he got colon cancer was very atypical in terms of the actual clinical presentation of the disease. And of course, 
because he was adopted, we don't know that clearly one of his parents also would have gone through this. Um, but the probability that, uh, again, you know, say you are listening to this and that you're, you know, you have this, it's, it's very low. This is a kind of a long winded way of saying that probably north of 95% of cancers are not germline mutations. They are somatic mutations. They are mutations that are acquired after you've received all of your genetic material. And I think we've known that for quite some time. We didn't need the genetic, um, we didn't need sort of the, the, the decoding of the human genome to figure that out. But the problem is the current type of genetic tests that I think this question is asking about don't measure those mutations. Because you only, you can't find those mutations in the DNA of the, you know, base cell. You actually have to look for those mutate. You have to look for those cells like a needle in a haystack. You're looking for those cells usually in the blood. And the good news is there are companies and technologies that are looking at these things. This, is, this belongs into a subheading of things called liquid biopsies, where um, you could do a blood test and in theory you could find that needle in a haystack. You could find that cancer cell that, um, you know, you could say, well, wow, this is a colon cell and it has an acquired mutation, and that mutation is giving it the capability to escape the colon and take up residence somewhere else. So I think from the standpoint of cancer, I don't think there's a lot of value. From the standpoint of cardiovascular disease, I would also say very little value. The most important genetic test that you would look at from a heart disease standpoint would be LP little a, which we've spoken about at length. So if you have the LPA gene, which honestly somewhere between about eight and 12% of the population does, maybe even higher, that's important to know. But guess what? You don't need a genetic test to do that. You can just measure the phenotype, meaning you don't need to know if you have the LPA gene, you can actually measure LP little a. It's even easier to measure. So again, that sort of, um, alleviates somewhat the, the need of knowing that. Now, whenever someone gets one of these tests, it tends to spit out a lot of information, like you're at increased risk of heart disease, you're at increased risk of diabetes. I, I, I think this is an area where I probably differ from a lot of the current crop of people who love precision medicine, and that I don't find that information very helpful. I think that if you go deep enough on the phenotypic side, you will get that information and you will get it in, a, in, in an even better way, and you will have a metric with which to track as you try to reverse the process. So taking diabetes for an example, does it help me to know that someone has a genetic predisposition to type 2 diabetes? Not nearly as much as it helps me to know, while they are still non-diabetic, that they have hyperinsulinemia. And even if they don't have it while fasting, to know that they have postprandial hyperinsulinemia, it's very important. To look at other subtle markers of insulin resistance, the elevation of ferritin, some of the other things that we see, other patterns of glucose disposal, these things matter a lot more. Frankly, just wearing a CGM and knowing over the course of months how your glycemic response is, that is orders of magnitude more insightful and perhaps more importantly, more actionable. Um, so I think the one place where I do think that the genetic information can be somewhat helpful is with Alzheimer's disease. I do think that knowing your APOE status is quite an empowering thing. I think truthfully, I don't think it should change that much of what we do. Um, in other words, even if you have an APOE3 or an APOE2, which would be a much lower risk gene, I wouldn't let that information in any way, shape, or form distract or detract me from taking an all hands on deck approach to avoiding dementia. Uh, as Richard Isaacson said when we had him on the podcast, if you have a brain, you're at risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so even though 25% of the population has APOE4 positive gene, meaning they're either one or two copies of APOE, and most of those 25% are single copy, they make up about two thirds of the case of Alzheimer's diseases. Um, but of course, that means 75% of people who don't have any E4 still make up a third of the cases. Mm. So in that sense, E4 is helpful if you need a little extra motivation to work harder. Again, it might be a little um, helpful if you're thinking about it through the lens of your kids. Um, should your kids play contact sports? You know, we talked about this before where 
your, the susceptibility to head trauma could go up with an ApoE4. So maybe that causes you to think we'll play tennis instead of soccer. Um, one of the questions was about nutrition, I think, and exercise. And I got to tell you, I am still not convinced that we can extract much value vis-a-vis -vis what we should be eating or how we should be tailoring our exercise from the current genetics. Now, there are probably some tests that are emerging that could be kind of interesting. Um, there are probably certain genes, you know, in the PPAR family, for example, that might speak to our ability to metabolize fat, that might speak to whether or not we will do better or do worse on a certain type of diet. But I would counter that by saying, you can empirically determine that mm -hmm. so easily that I'm not sure it's adding value. And even if you saw that you had a genetic predisposition to one diet or another, it still doesn't mean that that's going to work. You still have to go through the empirical step. So I think this is a long-winded way of saying, I'm just not over the moon excited about using sort of the current crop of genetic tests. Although we do it and virtually every one of our patients comes in the door with a genetic test, usually it's sort of one of these cheap kind of easy SNP tests, but, but probably 10% of them still show up with the whole sequence. And we do the full analysis and we look at it, but I'm str I, I could, I, I, it'll take me a while to remember the last time a piece of information emerged from that that made me change the way we were doing something, which doesn't mean it won't happen. It just means overall the yield is not that high and one should sort of calibrate their expectations uh, for that.